Hi, my name is Bob Greenier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So I'm here somewhere in, in Germany with Artifact and what you're looking at here is an original looking for heat little robot and a original setup here with the power supply here which you can see is a 36 volt uh, 11 amp standard kind of stock power supply. You've got a PID controller, you've got an SCR and a pulse width modulator um, device here. Now from working with Neil and our own investigations we found that this probably wasn't the same one that Neil was using. It was like this one so Artifact has secured this and Neil used a fan which we have to go over the top and so the system that we recovered from Neil's lockup was a generation on from this, but it wasn't the one as we understand it, according to Alan Smith of Looking for Heat, formerly of Looking for Heat, that actually did the Lion 12345. This is the kind of system with this modification. And in this instance, the SCR switches this power supply on and off, and then you've got the PID controller that gets in there and is targeting target temperatures. And then this one, that it adds a little bit of uh, pulse width modulation on the system. But again, we are going to replace it with this, which is like the one that Lion used. Now, in terms of materials, uh, we have the original looking for heat tubes. And these are uh, magnetic uh, soft iron, or rather they're soft iron uh, bolts here and you can see they are magnetic there we go and that is the sort of thing that will go into the tubes we need to get ones of slightly different diameter now over the end of the tubes uh, lion put some silver foil and here it is this is silver foil you can see from India we tested this type of foil that lion used on uh, Alan Goldwater's uh, SEM and it was 100% silver and round the outside of the tube he also had some uh, enameled copper wire and this is sort of the equivalent that was used by Lion. Uh, Neil Gould that is and then he used these dye pads which he heated up for a week at about 200 degrees centigrade and uh, what Artifact has done is he's taken them off here so that will be heated and baked uh, and then it's immediately dropped into some deuterium oxide like this. Now we are going to get some from the UK that is stored with the person that's looking after uh, Lion's effects, Neil's effects, and uh, we will actually use the ones prepared by Neil. Now once those are in there, then there is some alumina uh, Parkamov type sodium silicate and, uh, and alumina uh, type cement that is used and that seals up the tube and then around that and uh, when the copper is on there which Lion originally used the copper winding around the outside which was wound up and down uh, he, he did that uh, to allow some thermal contact between the inner tube and the actual uh, fused quartz tubes that you can see here where the cantile wire is providing the heating. Now in the back, uh, you can see there are some thermocouples here. And at the moment, uh, Artifact has this device, this digital, digital thermometer, but we are going to instrument it actually with the LabJack T7 Pro. And this was the one that was used for testing the claims of Me356 back in 2017 and put together by our uh, director, Ryan Hunt of Hunt Utilities. And into that, we will also be putting the MFM PC830 uh, power and um, phase uh, analysis device. And that will be connected into the input power to the Looking for Heat little robot setup. And then we will also have our Logitech uh, 920 here, uh, uh, either looking at the device or potentially later looking for radiation, but that will be able to be monitoring it. And we are configuring a computer here that will be doing the uh, monitoring of the whole experiment. Now, um, we're just doing some preliminary work and as part of that, I have brought various pieces of analysis equipment. Uh, we are going to be looking at frequencies that may be in the system 
uh, by sound and by uh, this electrosmog meter, which can uh, see um, magnetic fields and so forth. And then when we do the actual run, we'll have this eight, uh, alpha, beta, gamma detector and the uh, radio scan and radio code here um, for looking at any gamma emissions that might be there. I suspect, and I'm not, I've only mentioned this in passing, but I suspect that the solenoid around here, combined with the observed 22 kilohertz ripple and the um, uh, pulse width modulation on here, and the switching on of the um, SCR will lead to what's called a magnetostriction effect. And what that is, is if you have a solenoid around a piece of magnetic material, like nickel, as is in the diapad here, there is, that is a magnetic material, ferromagnetic material, or the iron, soft iron rod, and the solenoid is round there, that causes a distortion in the metal. And this is called magnetostriction, and there's an equivalent uh, with dielectric materials, possibly with diamond in electric fields, okay, which may also be going on. And what this will do is, as you've got these 22 kilohertz vibrations, which was what uh, we actually excluded when we did the rep uh, replication attempt uh, originally in California with Alan Goldwater, was um, uh, by putting a stainless steel uh, core into the center of the reactor, like this, into the center of the solenoid, we lost the ability to have this magnetostriction effect, which I wasn't really thinking about at the time, but it, I, since we have done the ultra experiments, it's become very clear to me the importance of sound. So when that is in the reactor, okay, and we probably have a shorter bolt, so it comes to somewhere about here, it is going to be producing high frequency sound. And if you know, you might have heard of mains hum on a transformer. And this is where the coil that's going on the soft iron that forms the magnetic loop in the transformer, that is doing this magnetostriction and it produces that main, that hum from your transformer. Obviously this will be in theory producing uh, uh, rare refraction pulses within the uh, gases within the reactor tube at the frequencies of the uh, 22 kilohertz ripple on here. So um, you got or or whatever ripple is eventually there and pulses. So that will be producing sound in there, which, and also on the nickel diapads up to the Curie temperature. Now we know that iron 57 aggregates magnetotoro electrical radiation, magnetotoro electrical clusters, exotic vacuum objects, uh, charge clusters, EVOs, uh, on the magnetic iron 57 from Roitzkev's work. We know that the material uh, in the magnets of Bogdanovich's work on the actual magnetic surfaces, according to them, when the gamma ray comes in, uh, they are claiming in, Uritzka, in um, Bogdanovich's work that is knocking the birdies off from the magnet. So we know it's collecting on magnets and we know it's collecting on the iron. I have this hypothesis that in the system where you have the iron acoustic waves, which will be generated by this magnetostriction, both on the nickel up to the Curie point of nickel and up to the 770 degrees of the iron Curie point, so if you are creating these clusters, they are going to bind to the iron. And as it goes through the Curie point of the iron, they will be released at exactly the same temperature. So you have clusters which potentially are quantized, and the quantization of those clusters will be released at exactly the 770 degrees centigrade. If the metal falls below 770 degrees centigrade, or the nickel falls below the Curie point nickel at 163 or whatever it is, degrees centigrade, then any clusters that are there will reattach to the iron because it then becomes ferromagnetic again. If it goes above, it will release them. So all of the released ones will be uh, at exactly the same temperature or thereabouts. And as we know, when we're trying to create coherent matter using, say, season 133 or um, 
the uh, uh, sodium-23 atoms in Bose-Einstein condensates, you're cooling that down to about absolute zero, let's say three or four degrees Kelvin. But it's actually either side of that, so you've got an averaging. So if you've got these clusters within a few degrees of each other, they're practically in a situation of being able to cohere in the same kind of level of uh, temperature variation that you might get in a normal coherent matter Bose-Einstein condensate environment. And as we know from the Lockheed-Martin patent, you can cohere matter of the same type at uh, the same kinetic energy, i.e. thermal energy, and therefore I believe that that leads to the large clusters that lead to the coherent matter structures and vortices and stuff that we actually see interacting in the Lyon reactor materials. Okay, so there's a, a more uh, deeper explanation of why um, I think the iron bolt, which we did not have in our replication in uh, original MFMP attempted replication, in California because we just simply didn't understand these things at that time and the importance of sound. Okay, now uh, as an initial attempt, hopefully uh, we are going to be able to see if we can hear some sound um, produced by this by inserting one of these bolts into here and firing it up and seeing if we can hear any sound. And we're also going to look some, for some fields. These are just preliminaries. Um, it's going to be a while before uh, everything is configured in a way that we can actually run experiments. Um, but essentially, with what Lion has left us, uh, thank you to Neil Gould for doing that, and the equipment that has been brought together by Artifact here, and the modifications to correct for the things that actually Neil Gould used, like a Lion, and the equipment we already have, we potentially have the ability to do an extremely good replication of his work. Over and above that, we have some boron oxide here that we can add, and potentially we have some Kerala sand here. Now, on this basis, um, it, it, we were aware that uh, Piantelli said nickel 62 was good for Lena. We're also aware that uh, Stoyan Sargatev, when he came to stay with me, uh, showed me his theory of how Rossi was creating his original sort of ECAS, in that he was using nickel-63. Now, nickel-63 is produced by irradiating with neutrons, uh, in typically in the RBMK Russian reactor, enriched nickel-62, and it produces a pure beta emitter of 100 point one year half-life of nickel 63 and he said that this would be enough the energy of those beta particles would be enough to initiate the formation of the right kind of clusters of matter that would allow for the production of the Lenner effect. I, I didn't really think too much about that at the time but of course we bought some nickel 62 from a uh, the American isotope company, which actually came from Russia. And the form of that was looked at under an SEM by Bob Higgins. And it looked exactly like the pure nickel 62 that was found in the Lugano hot re cat reactor um, some, some time back, the one that started the dog bone uh, kind of whole, whole series. And what happened was, uh, if you are looking at something like, it, basically Bob Higgins was saying it was the same form as the sample that we got from uh, the source uh, of nickel 62 and um, as what Rossi was using, um, it would seem because we found out that the supplier to us had also supplied Rossi according to them. Now, it could actually therefore be that Rossi had bought nickel 62, this is speculation, and he had activated that, and that was doing exactly what was hypothesized by Stoyan Sargachev, and that um, he actually had a pure beta emitter inside the reactor that would have created enough energy to create these clusters, and because it's a pure beta emitter, you would not have observed any radiation outside of the reactor. Now, we don't necessarily need to do that because we're not trying to um, pretend that we're not seeing any radiation outside the reactor. We could use potentially Kerala sand 
to enhance this process. But first off is can we replicate what Lion did? And I think with a better uh, understanding over the last few years and the equipment that we have here and with Lion prepared diapads like these uh, treated in his way with potentially whatever is in those white powders uh, vials, we have a very, very good shot of replicating it. So thank you very much to everyone that's helped over the years allow all of these things to be uh, able to be used. And thank you to Artifact for gathering these items in their original form and for giving a venue for an experiment to be conducted. And thank you to the curator of the Lion uh, FX in the UK, who uh, will be able to send the materials at some point for us to do the experiment. Thank you very much for your time. I'll see you in the next video.